All of us are leading lives which we think will make us happy. We're all consuming things, buying things, building things, taking things in, trying to satisfy some kind of inner desire. We all want to be fulfilled. How do we truly measure what it means to be satisfied in this world? If you're familiar with uh, thinking about both government policy and even NGO charitable activity on a global platform, you may be familiar with a term called social well-being, SWB. And all kinds of different measures have been invented by the United Nations, the World Health Organization, different schools of thought and different Ivy League schools around the world to try to answer one simple question. How do we truly measure what it means to be happy, fulfilled, satisfied in this world? And why is it that as we see wealth going up in a nation, happiness, reported levels of happiness seem to go down? Why is it that once we've reached a point where we have enough food and enough water, that we keep adding in more and more in terms of our economic success, and yet inside we can feel poorer at times? How is that possible? And this question has been around indeed for a long time, which is why so often we fill our life with distractions to distract ourselves from the problem of our own emptiness. And so we're looking to be entertained through television, through radio, through drinking, partying, whatever it may be, anything that can distract us or momentarily hold our attention because there's something within us that seems to be missing. When the distractions are taken away, all of a sudden, things are revealed and we're, we're wrestling with what it truly means to be full. And what I'd like to share with you is actually how Jesus Christ himself directly addressed this issue. So I'm going to read to you from Luke chapter 12, verse 13, where it says, someone in the crowd said to him, that's to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out and be on your guard against all kinds of covetousness or greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. Now this story is fascinating. Someone comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I want you to tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now what is this? Well, in the time of Jesus Christ, if you were an older brother, you inherited the bulk of the estate. When your parents died, you inherited most of it. In some cases, all of it. And your younger brother's got nothing. So, this is the younger brother, and he's coming to Jesus, and he's saying, look, please, you tell my brother. Divide the estate. Now, the question is, why does he want the estate divided? And the answer to that question is the same answer to the question, why do any of us want money? And the answer is, we don't want money for the sake of just having money. We want money for the things it will buy, for the things it will bring into our life, for all the satisfaction, the joy, the fun. That's why we want it. There's no point having it and doing nothing with it. We want it so that we can use it. So the chain of thought in the younger guy's mind is, look, I don't have this, and it hasn't happened, and I actually feel it isn't really very fair. 
So if you, Jesus, tell him to do this and he does it, I will get what I want and then I will be happy, I will be fulfilled. And so the chain of reasoning is a very common one. And Jesus starts off by doing something fascinating in this story. His first response is to say, okay, you want me to answer this question for you. Who has appointed me the judge in this issue? Now, it doesn't matter how the guy answers. If the guy says, well, I'm appointing you, then Jesus has authority. The next question is, will you listen to what I have to say? If the guy says, well, you have authority from God, Jesus will say, well, will you listen to what I have to say? It doesn't matter how he answers that question. The question he's saying is, do you really want me to tell you? Are you actually listening? Who is giving me this authority? And it doesn't matter how he answers it. You know that sometimes there are questions which we ask, and we often sometimes hope that somebody won't answer it unless they give us the answer we want. So frequently, we're worried about what it could mean to come to know Christ. Sometimes it is very, very difficult. We want other people to be like Christ. We don't want to be like it. If he tells us what he wants us to do, we better behave that way. Do you know the story of the two boys who are arguing in the kitchen and they're fighting? There's one cookie left and there are two of them and they're fighting and they're arguing about who had the most and who that one belongs to. The mother comes into the room and she's got a headache, she's tired. And she says, I can't believe it. You shouldn't be fighting like this. If Jesus were here, Jesus would say, let my brother have it. So the older brother turned to the younger brother and said, okay, you be Jesus. <laughs> Sometimes we're asking a question. Sometimes we're asking real questions. But we have to stop and say, wait a minute. Who has authority in my life to answer this question? Will I actually listen to what you have to say. So Jesus, first of all, takes him back to a point of authority. Then he actually drives him now back to an even deeper point. And he says to him, be on your guard against all types of greed. Now, the word translated greed there is a compound word as it's given to us in the Bible. It literally means to have a desire that cannot be satisfied. So when Jesus says in verse 15, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, the old fashioned translations translate it covetousness. It means to have an unsatiable desire. A desire, it doesn't matter how much you feed it, how much you give it, it's gonna come back. And Jesus says you need to be careful of those kinds of desires. Desires which can never properly be satisfied. And now he's actually making the guy stop and think. Now notice something. Jesus is not saying it is wrong to look for satisfaction or to want it. As a matter of fact, the Bible never questions the legitimacy of our desire for true happiness and fulfillment. It doesn't. There's a very famous passage in Isaiah chapter 55. Some of you may be familiar with it. And the Lord speaks these words. He says, come all of you who are thirsty, come to the water. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and your soul will delight. You will delight in the richest affair. Now, did you hear that? So do you see what God is saying here in Isaiah 55? He's not questioning the desire for fulfillment and satisfaction. He's questioning where you can find it. And there's a big difference between the two. He's saying, look, the desire you have is right, but the means by which you're trying to satisfy it are wrong. This inner desire you have for fulfillment, for satisfaction, cannot be satisfied by external means. It doesn't matter how much labor, how much time you pour into it. It doesn't matter how much gold, how much money you spend trying to achieve it. You will not find it there. But if you come to me, if you drink from the water I give, God says, you will be full and you will be satisfied. 
God is not questioning our desire for satisfaction. He is ultimately questioning where is it found. And so we now see this here in Luke 12, where Jesus says, be careful of greed, unsatiable desire. He then goes on to then say to the guy, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. In other words, even if you have more than enough, your wealth will not give you life. Even if you have more than you ever dreamed of, that wealth cannot give you life. Jesus says, look, there was a man, and he owned land, and the land produced a big crop, okay, a large harvest. Now, there's a little play of language here in the Greek and of the Gospel of Luke as it's written. The word to bring forth is phreto. It means to produce. Now, in Greek, if you take the letters E-U, and you put it in front of a word, it expands it, it makes it bigger. So as it's written in, in, in the Gospel of Luke, it says, Euphrato, from the euphros, from the abundance of things. So Jesus is saying, look, what happened here is very unusual. We're not talking about a usual harvest. We're not talking about so much acreage producing so much grain or so much fruit. What we had here was an overabundance, an oversupply. Okay, everything produced way more than he could have hoped for, way more than you might expect. This is a bumper crop. It is huge. And thankfully, it's not in a perishable state. This is actually grain he's producing, so it can be stored. So the guy is now thinking, I've made it. Life is okay. The only problem I have, he now says, is what do I do with the wealth? So he looks at his barns and he thinks, well, those are no good. So he tears them down. He says, build big ones, I need huge barns. And they build these huge barns and he stores all of this grain, all of this wealth in the barn. And he's thinking to himself, you know what? I can take a holiday and not just for a week or a month, I can take a holiday now for years. I don't need to sow next year, I don't need to harvest next year. I don't need anything next year, I don't need anything the year after that or the year after that, I've got so much stuff I'm made for life. And so now having come into more than he could have possibly have imagined, more wealth than he ever could have possibly dreamed of, he tears down his barns and he builds big ones. And he says to himself, you have plenty of grain for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now this word which is translated merry here, it can have be positive or negative. It's the context which allows you to tell whether it's good or bad. It is the same word here we translate Mary that in Luke chapter 15, when Jesus says, there was a man who had two sons and the one, younger one asked for his inheritance, sold it and went away and he lost everything. And when he was starving, he came back. And then the older brother comes and complains. Do you remember this story? The prodigal son, what are you doing? The father said, we had to celebrate. Now the word translated there, celebrate, is the same word, to be merry. We had to be happy. What is the appropriate response if something is lost and found? It's the same word. It's the context which allows us to tell whether it's positive or negative. So the question here is, is it positive or negative? So it's a very powerful image when it's used in Luke 15 about the lost son, a child that was lost and you found them, how would you feel if you got them back? So when the father said we had to celebrate, we had to be merry, do you understand the intensity of the word? The word actually translated merry is the Greek word euphron. Now the throne is the diaphragm, okay? To euphron, to put the Greek word E-U in front of the diaphragm means to make it big. So how do you make the diaphragm big? There must be singers in the audience. How do you expand your diaphragm? And the answer is go, okay, well done. You breathe in. And as you breathe in, the diaphragm is pushed down and now it's expanded. So when it says, be merry, it's saying literally, I'm gonna be big diaphragm. It's saying I'm gonna go, Ah, 
That's the word. So you see how the guy's thinking. From the euphros, from the abundance of things, comes the euphron, this deep inner satisfaction. That deep sigh where you can go, everything is great. It's the same word the father says about his lost child. We had to celebrate. We had to euphrone. We had to. <sighs> from the abundance of things, from the euphros, the euphrato, comes this abundance in life, the euphrone. Now, interestingly, as Jesus tells the story, as soon as the guy says this, God looks at him and says, you fool. Now, the word fool here is also very carefully chosen. The normal Greek word for fool, when you're reading the Greek New Testament, when you're reading the Bible in the language it was written in, the word for fool is the Greek word moron. It means to be a moron. It means to be really stupid, foolish, an idiot. But actually, that's not the Greek word used here. When it says you fool, it's not, it's not the word you're expecting. The word actually is a thrown, which is a more unusual word, but it still means to be a fool. But it has a different mental picture. The throne is the diaphragm. The, let, the, the Greek letter A, the Greek letter alpha, normally operates as a negative. It negates what comes after it. It means to be diaphragm-less. Jesus is saying, you who think that from the euphros, the abundance of things, comes the euphrone, the abundance of life, you will end up a throne. You won't have a diaphragm at all. And now the mental picture is not of someone breathing deep going, oh, everything's fine. The mental picture is now the opposite. It's of someone who is completely empty inside. In other words, this is going to deliver into your life the exact opposite of what you hoped it would. It's a very strong picture. Imagine how disappointing it is to climb all the way up to the top of the ladder of life only to realize the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. Well, that's what Christ is saying here. It is possible to set yourself on a course believing it will bring one thing, but when you actually get it, you're going to end up somewhere else. This story, once you get it into your head, you can't get it out. Jesus says, this is what it's like. You know, there are so many things that we bring into our lives. The reason we bring them in is we think they're going to make us happy. All of us do that. All of us are leading lives which we think will make us happy. We're all consuming things, buying things, building things, taking things in, trying to satisfy some, satisfy some kind of inner desire. We all want to be fulfilled. And the good news, the incredible news in the Bible is God isn't challenging that. He's not saying if you want to become a Christian, if you want to truly worship me, that what you need to do is deny yourself everything and just simply look miserable and be miserable. And the more miserable you are, the more holy you are, and the less happy you look, you know, the more, the best, the closer to God you are. He's not saying that at all. When we think of holiness, we assume that means incredible seriousness. But actually what God is talking about here is an incredible joy. I was speaking in Hong Kong uh, last year, and there was a lady, a very senior business executive, and she was on the front row. And all the time, she kept looking over her shoulder, looking around, all the time. Every 20 seconds, she would, she would look over her shoulder. It was actually a friend of mine who was speaking. And afterwards, she went up to this woman. They got talking. She said, do you mind if I ask you a question? She said, all the time when everyone was singing, you kept looking around. She said, all the time during the message, you kept looking around. Why were you doing that? And the woman said, should I lead a very large business? And I know what fake happiness looks like. And I know what it's, what it's like to pretend to be happy in front of reporters, your board, other people. 
He says, and what I don't understand is I'm looking around at everyone's face and I'm not seeing fake happiness. I'm seeing something real and I can't understand it. How is it possible for so many people to be rejoicing all at the same time? There is something that Christ is able to bring into our life that fulfills us. He is not challenging your desire to be fulfilled. What he is challenging is where that fulfillment ultimately comes from. And he's saying, well, you need to be rich before God. Now, what does that mean? Well, let me just bounce back into Isaiah 55 because we started reading that passage. And the answer is actually found in the following verses. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him when he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord. He will have mercy on them and to our God. He will freely pardon. Verse 10, God says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is the word that goes from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and you will be led forth in peace. Now, do you see what God then says? My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. As the heaven is as high above the earth, so are my thoughts and ways above yours. But just as the rain comes down from heaven and the snow to earth, my word can come down from heaven to the earth and water it and make it flourish and it will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Well, what's the purpose he sent it? Well, we're told the purpose was he wants to forgive us and pardon us. So when this word of God comes from heaven to earth, it achieves the purpose for which he sent it. We are forgiven. He can forgive us. And what is the result? You'll be sent forth in joy. You'll be rejoicing. You will suddenly know this true you thrown in life, this deep satisfaction because He has come to you. This is about God coming from heaven to earth. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. He came from heaven to earth. The purpose for which He came was to forgive and freely pardon. This Word achieves the purpose for which it was sent from heaven to earth. Where does your satisfaction come from? Where is true joy found? And the answer is only in Jesus Christ. But notice the means by which he achieves it. First of all, God comes from heaven to us that Jesus is not talking about. God is not talking about us trying to find God. There isn't a path from earth to heaven, but there is a path from heaven to earth. God makes it. He comes down to us. And then he offers to freely pardon us now, why is this so important? The answer is, it's because we've all done things which are wrong. In the pursuit of pleasure, we have done things which have hurt us, which have harmed us, which have broken us. We have done things which have damaged us. Now then, you have any idea what you're looking at? Okay, this is Hebrew. Now, let me explain it. Do you see the difference between these two words? They look very identical to you. The one at the bottom here is Hebrew hal. You put you, yar at the end, you have the word hallelujah. Praise his name. This word here, hal, with a hard H, hallelujah, profane his name. The difference between a hallelujah before God, a praising of His holy name, and a hallelujah, a profaning of His name, happens by closing this little gap here. And it converts this from a soft H to a hard one. The distance between what it means to live a life that profanes God's name and pleases His name is covered by the distance between these two. 
when you close that gap. And the result is when you live that way, you end up hurting yourself. It literally damages our bodies. We're seeking pleasure. We're doing something which at the time often feels good and we desperately want it. But we're reaping the harvest in our own bodies and we live with the consequences of it and it's impossible to get rid of. There are other things which we do. Spending our money, our time on things that we think should satisfy us, should please us, should fulfill us, and they don't. So we do more of it and more and more. And every time you need to do something more extreme to get the same amount of pleasure. We need something bigger and bigger, more and more, just to give us the same amount so we end up going faster. They call it a hedonic treadmill from hedonism, trying to get pleasure. The hedonic treadmill, you have to run faster and faster just to maintain the same level of satisfaction in life. And in the pursuit of that, we do all kinds of things which are wrong. We compromise ourselves, we hurt ourselves, we live with the guilt or the pain or the fallout of it, and we wonder how on earth do we get past it? And the answer isn't to run faster. The answer is to stop and turn to God. And instead of drinking salt water of this, that, from this world, you drink the pure water that comes from Him. It doesn't matter how much salt water you drink, it will never satisfy your thirst. And actually, if you keep on drinking it, it will kill you. But if you turn to Him, He can forgive you. He can wipe the slate clean. Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth. He came into this world and He made Himself one with us. That's what happens when you put your trust in Christ. You become one with Him. And all the stuff that's flown into your body, all of the poison, all of the brokenness, all of the pain, it becomes His. He takes it on into Himself. And when He goes to the cross, He pays the price for what we have done. By His stripes we are healed. All of that pain, all of that hurt, all of that poison in life, all of the curse that flows from going against Him and doing the wrong things, all of that becomes translated onto Jesus Christ. All of the sin we have done becomes His. That's why the Bible says when Jesus Christ went to the cross, He became sin for us. All of the curses in our life, all of the spiritual damage and hurt that is in our life gets onto Him. That's why the Bible says He became a curse for us. This is very powerful language. It's saying everything which was in us is now put on in Him. And He pays the price. He takes on the consequences for what we have done wrong. And He lays down His life. And He pays. And through His resurrection, He conquers over all of it. And He comes to us and says, turn to me, drink from me. Your soul will delight in the richest affair. I don't know what it means to you to be a Christian or what you think it may mean to lead a holy life or to be made holy by God. He's not interested in emptying you. He's actually interested in filling you. He can feed you and water you with things that you cannot possibly imagine. Some of you have already heard parts of my testimony where I talked about the fact I didn't want to become a Christian because I thought I would become miserable. After I became a Christian, I couldn't hide the joy which I knew. It was impossible. Everybody thought I'd gone crazy. I can remember I'd go to church, I'd come back one Sunday lunch, I was having lunch with some friends, they looked at me, they said, what did you do this morning? I said, I went to church. They looked at me, they said, but you look so happy. You could see the logic. You've been to church, you should be feeling miserable. Why are you so happy? And the answer is, because I've been forgiven, because someone's changed my life because there's a fulfillment in my life I thought wasn't even possible. It doesn't matter how much money I spend, how much, how much time I put into it. And I put a lot of time into trying to make myself happy. What are the things that you're pursuing? Where is your energy going? Your creativity, your money, your labor, your gold, where is it going? Does it satisfy? Christ came into this world. He alone can meet the deepest desires of our heart. He alone can satisfy us. He's able to deal with all of the guilt, the pain, 
and the hurt in this world because he came from heaven to earth, the living word. And at the cross, he crucified it there. And through his resurrection, he offers us a new life in him. And we can know that forgiveness. And we can know that joy. It will not return to me empty. It will accomplish what I desire. It will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And you will go out in joy and you will be led forth in peace.